Okay, so let's, um, before we dive in, let's just talk a little bit about the data that we're gonna use today. So, like I said, this data comes from uh, meetup.com, which I think most of you are, are familiar with. Um, so because most of you are, are meetup.com users, you've probably seen the recommendations that Meetup makes to you. And these come in lots of different formats, and, and some of them you may not even realize are personalized recommendations. Um, but we receive sort of these, these invitation emails that say, hey, here's an event uh, that you might be interested in. Uh, we see uh, sort of on, uh, on the website itself, we see um, sort of these are groups that you might be interested in joining. Uh, and when we're, when we're searching for groups, the ordering there is not just sort of alphabetical or at random. The ordering there is personalized based on sort of what Meetup thinks is going to be the most relevant for us. And of course, these recommendations have to be relevant because you, you know, we can't just spam our users every time there's a meetup anywhere in the world with an email and say, hey, why don't you go to this event? Um, people have sort of limited bandwidth for dealing with that, so we have to make sure that the email that we're sending to invite them to an event is relevant for the user, that there's a, a high probability they're actually going to be interested in, in that content. And, and the same with you know, things on, say, like Twitter. Like, these are people you might be interested in following. There's limited screen real estate that, that we can use. So in order for these recommendations uh, to actually um, encourage people to engage with our application, we need to make sure that they're as relevant as possible. So that's, that's key in um, coming up with recommendations, especially personalized recommendations, is ensuring that they're relevant. So we talked about the, the types of recommendations we can make, groups that you may be interested in joining, uh, topics that you might be interested in following, right? So you can follow topics without actually joining, uh, joining a group. And then specific events that we might be interested in attending. So, uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, the sort of approach of a meetup.com user, and the first thing we wanna do is recommend groups uh, for them to join. And initially, we'll sort of start without personalized information about the user, and then we'll sort of build up uh, our data model so that we can make more and more complex and relevant recommendations. Uh, I should say this data comes from the, the Meetup API. So earlier in the week, um, I wrote a script to uh, fetch data uh, for meetups in Austin, uh, mostly technology meetups in Austin. Um, so what the script does is it finds all of the uh, groups first, then it fetches the members of the group, then uh, for each member gets, okay, what are the events that you've RSVP'd to, what are the topics you're interested in, uh, and that kind of thing. So this is all information that you can, that you can see on, on the Meetup site, right? So events have a title, they have a description, they have a venue. Uh, groups have topics. So these are uh, topics that the organizer of the group has said that uh, are relevant for the group. So it's interesting to note that with the data that we get from Meetup, we have topic information about the group but not about the event. Um, so one of the things we're going to do is actually see how we can um, infer uh, some of the topics at the event level uh, to, to sort of enhance the type of recommendations that, that we can make. So this is the kind of data that we have. Um, what didn't I mention? Oh, we have time and date and location information as well. So this is, this is important. Um, Location stuff, I don't think we'll get to today, but, um, but that's in the guides here. So okay, so, so starting off, um, let's first make a, a super simple recommendation query that says, as a member of, and, and we'll just assume that we're all members of the Graph Database Austin group. Is, any, is anyone actually a member of that group? One, okay. Well, we're gonna assume that we're all members of that group, um, and 
Based on that information, we want to find other similar meetup groups to join um, because I'm, I want to expand sort of the, the meetup groups that, uh, that I'm a member of. So we need some definition of similarity for comparing groups. And what we're going to use initially are topics. So we said that uh, every group has topics that are relevant for the group. So a simple way to measure similarity would be, OK, groups with lots of the same topics are similar. Uh, so if you're a member of the graph database, Austin group, we're going to find groups that have similar topics, uh, and we're going to recommend those groups to you. So that's our super simple approach. We need a graph data model, first of all, um, before we can start importing the data and querying the data. Uh, so what is our model going to look like? Well, uh, we're going to have group nodes, so nodes with the label group uh, that have a name property. So we're going to have one node for the Graph Database Austin group. We're going to have one node for, say, the Austin NoSQL group. Uh, and then we're going to have topic nodes. Uh, and again, those are going to have topic nodes are also going to have a name property. Um, so maybe NoSQL is a topic that we'll have. Groups will be connected to these topics with a has topic relationship. So we might have the Graph Database Austin group is connected to the topic NoSQL. The NoSQL Austin group is also connected to the NoSQL topic. Uh, therefore, there's some similarity between the two groups. We talked about the labels, relationships, properties. We don't need to worry about this because we have Sandbox. So let's jump. Uh, back into Neo4j. Oops. There we go. And I'm going to click on number one here, recommend groups by topic. And so again, we said this is a carousel, so I can sort of move through these. Uh, and any of these, these sort of grade, like pre tags that you see, I can click on these to load, uh, load that query into the query editor. Uh, up here, uh, and then I can either hit Control Enter to run those, uh, or I can hit the play button here to run those. Uh, and, and you can see that every time I run a query, it opens a new frame and then pushes down what I was working with previously. Uh, I can pin this guide to the top. This might be helpful. So if I click on this, that will pin it to the top. And now when I run a query, um, the new frame comes below that guide. So that might be useful for not, not getting lost. I'm not going to do that because I have limited um, screen real estate here. Actually, let me close some of this stuff. I don't need that. Yeah, good enough. OK. Cool. So, um, so this is what I want to do. I want to find groups that are similar to the Graph Database Austin uh, meetup group so that I can, uh, can recommend those. Uh, so I need some data, first of all, since we said we're starting with a blank Neo4j instance. Um, and let's look at the data that we have. So, so I said that we, we scraped this data from the meetup API, um, and we stored it in some CSV files. So CSV is a really common format. Most databases can, can export and import uh, CSV. And with Neo4j, we use, the, well, I should say that there are many different ways we can import CSV files uh, with Neo4j. One of those, and, and probably the easiest way, is using uh, load CSV, which is a feature within Cypher that lets us refer to a CSV file, either local or remote, um, pipe that in, and then use Cypher to define how we want to work with the data in that CSV file. So here's an example. Um, we say load CSV, and in this case, with headers, uh, because the CSV file has headers. 
from some URL. Um, so this is, this is hosted on, on S3 somewhere. Uh, and we're just going to load this groups.csv file. Uh, we're then going to alias it to row. So row now becomes a variable um, that we can use to refer uh, to the data in our CSV file. And everything after this point is executed once per row in the CSV file. So essentially, this allows us to iterate over every row in the CSV file. Um, and what are we going to do with this row object? So row, because we said with headers, uh, we're now parsing this CSV file. And row now becomes an, an object or a dictionary or a map, whatever you want to call it, with key value pairs uh, based on the headers from our CSV file. And in this case, all we're going to do is just return this row object, and then we're only going to look at the first 10. So load our CSV file, and then return uh, the first 10 rows that we're parsing into uh, these objects. So we can see here this object, this first one, this represents one row in the CSV file. Um, we have a name, an organizer name, a URL, description. We have an ID um, for the group. We have some average rating for the group. We have a link to the group. Uh, we have the member ID of the organizer. And we have the timestamp of when it was created. And we can scroll through here and, and sort of see, OK, yeah, for the first 10, this is the, the information that we have. So OK, that's, that's how we can sort of pull this data in and, and parse it. But we actually need to create some data in Neo4j. So we can do this using the create command. So instead of just returning the data, uh, we'll say create. Uh, and then we define some graph pattern uh, that gets passed to the create statement. Uh, we said that nodes are defined within parentheses. So all we want to do is iterate through the CSV file. And for each row, uh, for each group, we want to create uh, a node with a label group. And then we want to set a bunch of properties on that node. So things like the ID, the name, the URL name, uh, the rating, and then the timestamp of when it was created. Uh, so note here that we need to cast uh, rating and created to integers. By default, everything that we bring in with load CSV uh, becomes a string. But we have types in, in Cypher and Neo4j that we can work with. So we're going to cast those to integers. And if we run that, OK, we've created 200 nodes, set some properties. And now we can actually write a match statement. Um, so I'm going to change this a little bit. So let's match on all nodes with the label group. And we'll bind those to the alias G, which we can refer to later. And I'm just going to return G. So this is going to return all group nodes that we just created. And we can see, OK, we get this, this sort of graph visualization. And I say sort of a graph visualization because we only have nodes here. We don't have any, any relationships. But we can you know, click on one and, and inspect the properties. So this is um, C++ Advanced Mentoring Group. Here's the Austin Redis meetup group. So each one of these nodes represents a group. OK. Um, we can also return tabular data from Cypher. So previously, we returned uh, just G, which is a node, so some graph object. Uh, but we can also return just properties from the node. So let's match on every group and now return the ID, the name, and the URL name. And if we do that, we get some sort of tabular uh, output. And if we think about why we want tabular output when, when we're working with a graph, well, 
maybe we're doing some sort of aggregation or, or group by, um, or you know, we're building an application. Our, our front end doesn't understand graph data, but it, it, you know, it understands uh, rows for, uh, for our table view or something like that. So Cypher is flexible enough to sort of be able to traverse graphs and, and return graph data or tabular data. OK, so we've created um, our groups now. The next thing we want to do is now import our topics. So we said we were going to have topic nodes uh, as well. Uh, but we need to talk about how we can uh, avoid creating duplicates. And that leads us to this idea of constraints and indexes. So in our groups CSV file, we have one row for every group. So we don't need to worry about creating duplicates um, because we can just create a node for each row, and, and that's fine. Um, however, um, we may have the case, uh, which we will in, in a moment, and we want to import topics, where we have topics repeated uh, throughout our source data. And we want to avoid creating duplicates, so we have just sort of one node that represents the NoSQL topic. Uh, we don't want to have multiple NoSQL topic nodes floating around. Um, and so far, we haven't created uh, any, any constraints or indexes or any sort of schema. So Neo4j is what we call schema optional. Uh, so we can work with Neo4j without defining a schema, um, and that's, that's perfectly fine. But it may be the case that we want to define uh, some part of a schema, at least to give us some data integrity guarantees. And this is where this idea of constraints comes in. Um, OK, so, so the, the first problem is avoiding uh, creating duplicates. Um, and for that, instead of create, we're going to use a keyword called merge. Merge is an upsert or uh, get or create. Um, so the way merge works is we merge on some graph pattern. So this piece down here, some graph pattern that uniquely identifies a node. So in our case, uh, we have IDs. Uh, for, for everything, pretty much. So the unique piece is going to be the ID. And then uh, once we've done the merge, we can then set some additional properties. But it's important that we only merge on just the part of the pattern that is unique. And we can use merge for, uh, for nodes, relationships, and more complex graph patterns um, as well. So merge will allow us uh, to avoid creating duplicates, but it doesn't give us a data integrity guarantee at the schema level of the database. Uh, for that, we need to create a uniqueness constraint. So uniqueness constraints um, do two things. One, they guarantee uniqueness, uh, but they also give us an index on, uh, on some property that allows us to do fast lookups. So this is the syntax for creating a uniqueness constraint. We say create constraint on some label. Assert label.property is unique. Um, we can also create indexes without creating a constraint. Uh, so when we get to importing members, we'll have an ID for a member, and that's the same thing uh, that we use to identify uniqueness. So that is a unique ID for member. Uh, but then members also have a name. Um, but we can allow members to have the same name. So I, I'm not the only will in meetup.com. Uh, so that's perfectly fine. But it might be the case where we want to be able to do um, an efficient lookup uh, for users with the name will. Um, so that's a case where we want to create an index. This is the syntax in Cypher for creating an index. We say create index on colon label, then the property that we want to index in parentheses. 
Um, so what, what operations use an index for lookups? Well, things like equality, any of the string comparison operators, uh, range searches, um, and then existence checks. So checking whether or not some property exists uh, on a node will use an index. And we talked a little bit about indexes before when we said that Neo4j doesn't use an index for traversing the graph. So then what do we need indexes for with a graph database? So I think it's helpful to, uh, to compare how we use indexes in a graph database with how we use indexes in, um, in a relational database. So in a relational database, um, we do joins. So a join in a relational database is sort of the equivalent of traversing a relationship in a graph database. Uh, and a join is a set comparison operation. So uh, we have two tables, two sets. We sort of join those two together using an index to see where they overlap. And that's the result of our join. Um, now, the, the problem with that is as those sets, as those tables grow, the performance of that index lookup, that join, to see where those tables overlap, um, the performance of that breaks down um, as those tables get very, very large. Now, with a graph database, we said, well, we don't use an index to traverse the graph. Um, we're just do, essentially doing pointer arithmetic for that. Um, so the, the performance of that traversal is not going to break down uh, as we have more and more data. But we still need to use indexes in a graph database to find our starting point for queries. Um, so we can traverse from one node to any other without using an index, but we still need some sort of entry point into this, this local traversal somewhere to start. And for recommendations, this is typically um, starting at a user that you want to generate recommendations for, or starting at some product to find similar products. Um, so it's typically, okay, use an index lookup to find this user, either by name or by ID, uh, or by SKU for a product, something like that. Um, we'll use an index to do just that initial lookup to find our starting point, but then any traversal we do out from there is not going to use an index. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is when I say, um, you know, essentially pointer arithmetic, do I, do I really mean like pointers in memory? Um, sort of. So, so the, the file store for Neo4j is implemented essentially as a doubly linked list. Um, so every, every node has an ID, an internal ID, uh, that's just an offset in the node store. Um, so then in the relationship store, I essentially have um, that offset stored for any relationship um, so that I can just go directly to uh, the place in the node store that represents that node. Um, so that's, that's how the graph is stored in the file system. Um, but then we can also cache the graph in memory, right? Um, so that we don't hit sort of the performance impact of going to disk to read that. And, and then, it, then it really does just become Point arithmetic, if it's cached in memory. Yeah. Does, does that key know that to take advantage of this optimization memory? So it's still it's still the same big O, right? Um, because you're you're just incurring the the sort of the speed to, to read from disk. Um, but yeah, you're gonna have better performance if you can cache the graph in memory as traversing it. Yep. Yes, yeah, so maybe we'll pause here and, and take any more questions um, that folks have. <coughs> no? Okay. Okay, so that was a little bit of an aside on um, how we can define sort of a, a schema by defining constraints, how we use indexes. Uh, so let's get back to importing data here. And we, we said we want to add topic nodes 
And we said that we have uh, some ID on uh, our topic nodes. So let's go ahead and create a constraint on the ID property on the topic label. Uh, so that will ensure that we're not creating uh, duplicates. And then let's go ahead and do the same for groups, uh, even though we've already imported that data. Uh, and then we can verify that our constraints are online um, by typing colon schema, uh, or we can use a different syntax. Um, by the way, these are, these are both down here. So we can say call db dot constraints, and this will sort of show us the, the constraints that we have that are online. Note that we also get indexes uh, for both of these when we created the constraint. OK, so now we're ready to look at the data that we have for topics. So we have the CSV file called groups underscore topics dot CSV. .csv. So let's, uh, let's inspect that. Um, so for every row in this groups topic CSV, we have a group ID, we have a name, an ID, and a URL key. So what is this? So the way we got this data uh, was first we looked up every group, um, and then for each group, we fetched the topics. So what we have here is for every group, every topic that's associated with that group. So that means um, whatever, whatever group this, uh, this is that has group ID of 107572, it has the topic open source, but open source is going to show up uh, with the same ID later on when we get to the next group in our file that has the topic open source. So this is why we want to ensure that we're not uh, creating duplicates as just by sort of creating one topic for each row in the CSV file. So this ID, this is the thing that uniquely identifies uh, the topic. So essentially our primary key for, uh, for the topic label. So now we can, uh, so I just clicked on the second query here that uh, loads the CSV file, um, aliases it to row, then we use this new merge keyword that we talked about to merge on the ID property on topic, because we said that's the thing that uniquely identifies a topic. And then we set some additional properties on the topic node, like the name and its URL key. So we create some topic nodes, um, and you know, we, can, we can match on topics. And again, we can see sort of these topics as, as nodes just floating around, uh, but we still don't have any relationships uh, in our data. So let's fix that. So now we're going to iterate through this groups underscore topic CSV file again. Uh, and now we know the topic and the group already exist in the database, so we're going to use a match to look those up. So for each row, find the topic, find the group by ID, and now we use merge to uniquely create this relationship. So create this has topic relationship that connects the group and the topic. So we run this and we create uh, 2300 relationships. Uh, so now we can actually write a query that's an actual graph traversal. So now we can say match on some graph pattern. Uh, what's the pattern? Well, the pattern is where we have uh, groups that are connected to a topic and return the group in the topic node, uh, but only the first 10. So sort of find 10 paths uh, sort of at random and see what we have. And we end up with two groups here. So here's the Austin MySQL meetup group and Austin coders and hackers. Uh, we can see that they share the topic open source. And we can see some other topics that they don't have, uh, they don't have in common. And we can double click on any of these to traverse out again. Um, so we can see here now uh, the Austin Cassandra users group, Ember, Chick Tech, these all um, share the topic MySQL. So thinking of how are we going to find similar 
uh, similar groups? Well, we can already infer some similarity between these. Uh, and, and by the way, this, this idea of sort of inferred relationships here. So we're saying that the Austin MySQL group has topic MySQL. Chick Tech also has my topic MySQL. So there's some sort of inferred connection here, some inferred similarity here. Um, in graph theory, this is called a triadic closure. So we're, we're closing uh, a triangle. Um, and this is a really important thing, uh, working with graphs, just this, this concept of triadic closures um, as sort of identifying inferred relationships. OK, so we, we imported uh, some data. Um, let's go ahead and create some indexes. So if we remember what we, what we said we wanted to do was assume that we're all members of the Austin Graph Database Meetup, and we want to find similar groups to recommend, well, we're going to need to look up the group by name, because um, I, don't, I don't know what its ID is off the top of my head. And we could, we could look that up without, uh, without using an index. Um, but you know, we want to make sure that's performant. So we're going to create an index on uh, group name and then also topic name uh, while we're at it. And we can verify those are online by looking at uh, the output of db.indexes. OK, but before. Before we do that, um, we said we wanted this to be you know, hands-on and, and interactive. Um, so we have our first exercise here. Um, so we have five questions that we want to, to work through. Um, so the first one, uh, what's the most popular topic? Uh, the second one, which group was created most recently? How many groups have been running for at least four years? Find groups with Neo4j or data in their name. And what are the distinct topics for those groups? So, um, so let's spend uh, some time uh, working on these. And we're 15 minutes before the break. Um, so let's spend the, the next, um, let's say, few minutes working on these, um, and then we'll break, and then when we come back from the break at 3.30, we'll go through, uh, go through the answers for these. So I guess that gives us 45 minutes for break and exercise time, and I'll be uh, sort of going around um, to help everyone. Uh, I want to point out this super important resource, uh, the Cypher ref card, which is linked down in the bottom here. This is the reference document for Cypher. Um, so definitely we'll want to use this. It has sort of all of the uh, keywords and lots of different examples uh, that we can use while working through this. Uh, and the other thing I want to point out is that question number one, uh, the most popular topic, um, that's the most difficult of all of these. Um, so we, we start with the most difficult first. So uh, if, you're, if you're struggling on that one, um, go ahead and, and work through the rest uh, and then come back to, to that one. Cool. So, um, so we'll, we'll start up again at, uh, at 3.30, going over um, the results. Um, and again, I'll be, be wandering around to, to help folks. If there's anyone who wasn't able to get um, Near4j sandbox going or had trouble importing any of the data, flag me down first so we can make sure that we get that resolved um, so that you can, can catch up for the next part um, of the course. And if you want to, if you want to, you know, if all this is, is um, sort of easy for you, um, feel free to, to sort of work ahead at your own pace. We're just going to work through, um, you know, sections one, two, three, and four. So if you're, if you're ahead of us, feel free to continue to, to work ahead. 